Welcome to Getting High on Anthropology. I'm Marty Otanya, the producer. Uh, today we have a guest, Melanie Rose Rogers. She's the owner of Influential X, and she's a cannabis advocate. So Melanie, thank you for coming on Hi, the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. We saw each other Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday uh, in the middle of October at an event. And you played a key role in organizing the event. So tell us about your role and what the event was all about. Sure. So. Um, the event was marijuana for medical professionals, and it was the third biennial, um, MJ for MDs for short. Um, and this event started in 2014, and the purpose of it is really to help educate doctors. And with that, this is Colorado's longest running um, medical cannabis conference that offers continuing medical education credits. So not only are we uh, bringing doctors together and they're learning, we're, we actually worked within a accreditor, uh, a university, to help provide uh, about 17 plus CME credits over the three-day conference. And so what kind of people need the credits? Mm -hmm. That's like a kind of specific thing about the audience members at the conference. Mm -hmm. And then what other kinds of people go to the event? So uh, this event was specifically for medical professionals, um, ideally doctors with our CME accreditation, and then nurses, um, we were, which is uh, CEU credits, or C, yeah, CEU credits. And so the audience of the attendees is specifically doctors looking to learn to continue their uh, medical education. So nurses, even my mom being a nurse practitioner, um, would go back to school or attend conferences for these continuing education credits because you eventually learn the latest and greatest of what's happening in patient care, how, to, you know, medications, um, um, anything else that would help a physicians or a nurse practice. So for people who are new to cannabis mm -hmm. and, and all the different kinds of products, so a medical professional gets information from this conference. Mm -hmm. So what would be one of the ways where people can use cannabis in their wellness care? So, so physicians, nurses, and others would integrate this in their in their um, practice. Mm -hmm. Like how, like take us through how it works with patients in in a couple words. Uh, sure thing. So, um, if you were a physician attending the conference and say you were in an emerging market um, like Pennsylvania or Illinois, and you kind of wanted to learn maybe from doctors or other um, pr physicians that were. Um, in practice and offering recommendations for a medical marijuana card or how um, we had a, a very amazing example with um, Dr. Uma actually, uh, Dahana Balin from Uplifting Health and Wellness of Massachusetts, she shared that she has, you know, these ABCs that she teaches her patients about, you know, definitely hydrating before you consume. Um, journaling, I found very important. I think that's something that's often missed with anyone trying to, um, you know, t try cannabis or use that for a specific condition that they're trying to treat is that they need to journal. So it was just great to have, you know, doctors coming together, learning from each other. It's really, I mean, I've been to many conferences in the cannabis industry and usually there's a handful, like one out of like 40 um, people, there's, you'll find one medical professional. So the idea of this conference is really getting these medical professionals on board with, you know, things they can use, pearls from their practice. Um, and things like that. That's great. So you guys are providing a service by making opportunities available for people to get information to practice it in the medical field. Absolutely. So you do a lot of other stuff too. Mm -hmm. So the conference uh, is just one of a couple activities. You're also the owner of Influential X. Yes. So tell us about that and what kinds of activities or services that you provide. Sure thing. So um, Influential X really is um, dedicated to creating um, influential and experiential um, experiences so that's events and also marketing campaigns but um, the three focuses within influential acts are education advocacy and social responsibility um, i believe deeply and that's how, why i've aligned myself with the marijuana for medical professionals conferences because they are educating in a space where i'm just one very passionate about it and two um, medical professionals, I believe, just, you know, they weren't taught about cannabis in med school and they just need furthering information. So that way patients can go to their doctors and talk about, you know, cannabis and they don't have to hide and we can actually have, you know, the medicinal conversation between patient and doctor. 
And so to clarify, is it a for-profit or not for-profit? So um, Influential X is a for-profit, and we support nonprofits. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the reason I was curious, because it's no joke to start a business, especially mm -hmm. in a sector. So take us through maybe you know one or two challenges that you face to start Influential X, and how did you overcome that challenge? Oh, um, great. Well, definitely, I think just you know, I'm a firm believer of following your passion and making it work for you. So ideally, you know, I'm a consultant. I can consult in various things, marketing, business development, branding, communication, but all of that being, you know, how do I tie that and how do I, you know, be a good influence in the community? So just, I think one thing, you know, from a branding perspective is how do you come up with a name that's going to summarize what you do? Um, and for me, with Influential X, I've kind of coined that, you know, the X factor in your influential experience, you know, depending on what that is, whether it's you're launching a product, you're creating a conference that you're trying to attract, if you're doing a fundraiser, just how do I tie in education, advocacy, and social responsibility in one thing? And so I think uh, just starting off as influential X and really having the courage to follow my heart and to know that this way, by having my own consulting business, I'm able to help the people that well align in those areas, and I'm staying true to myself and, tr and true to the company. That's great. And or the nonprofit and their and their mission. That's excellent. So between now and let's say the next 12 months, where do you hope to go with Influential X? Um, so right now, I believe I'm building a um, a brand for myself and really kind of. Um, you know, I have some long-term goals of where I, I see Influential X. I would like to highlight other people in the space that are going out and uh, doing good in the cannabis industry specifically, um, including hemp. I'd like to work with them to create either programs or marketing campaigns to showcase, you know, how they're educating the community, what they're doing to be a good citizen by, you know, being an advocate, and then also, um, you know, fundraising and doing things that, you know, really drive community engagement. Awesome. And so I, I totally understand one of the pillars of Influential X and your work is education. Mm -hmm. You also have this phrase or term, um, responsibility. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean to you and why is it important in the cannabis sector? Oh, that's a great question. So why it's so important is that, I mean, if we look at this cannabis plant and um, it's been um, for 81 years, the, you know, we're in our 81st year of prohibition. And it all started with the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937. And I actually launched my Influential X, this, my business, around October 5th of last year. So I'm coming up about a year into it. And um, where I was um, with this and why we need to be responsible is that for 81 years, cannabis has had a really bad rap. I mean, they, I mean, from anywhere from racial to, um, you know, just everything of, of you know the persecution people still going to jail for this plan mm -hmm. um, you know the the target on brown and black people in the community how they are by fact they have more black and brown people in jail under the use of cannabis or possession than any other race yeah. um, and so I feel that you know in order to kind of wash the stigma or just show the cannabis community in a better light we need to always be doing good it just helps strengthen our community like we're fighting 80 years of like a misconception that people sometimes just can't even get over um, so that's why I, I strongly believe in, in doing good and you know I'm very fascinated with B corporations and how you know the social impact and how we're actually taking care of each other rather than being um, focused on making lots of money like if you look at a C corp and an S uh, and a B corp B Corp is all about the social good and giving back. So that's kind of why I believe so much in, in tying in social responsibility and everything that we do in the community. That's great. No, I really appreciate that because I think we agree we want the sector to work better for more people. Mm -hmm. And so part of that means, you know, looking at whatever best practices are there that could ensure, you know, there's some justice in the cannabis sector mm -hmm. and that we, you know, look at how in Colorado, um, you know, the legislation was passed. People who supported the legislation also were under the impression that there would be some kind of like addressing these past injustices. Mm -hmm. And so part of the work you're also doing is looking at individuals who have been incarcerated and trying to get them to have their sentences dropped. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell me about that? You had like some information that you wanted to share? Sure, um, I do. So actually I'd like to say that um, 
there is a National Expungement Week. NEW is the new acronym, um, National Expungement Week. And it's happening across the nation in the U.S. from um, October 22nd to October 27th. And in that week, cities around the nation, like L.A., even Connecticut, New York, um, they are putting together, you know, something that helps expunge um, records. And I'm going to just touch a little bit about that, and I, we have more details on that. But um, how I see it is that there are people out there, majority, you know, minorities, that have been persecuted by the drug war, whether it's possession um, or it's, you know, maybe it's possession and then y you're unable to get work after. Or they're just like in this kind of circle that they, you know, the one thing that they got, um, a misdemeanor or a felony or something, has kept them from being a you know, having an equal playing field as everyone else in society, whether it's getting a job, having opportunities, getting housing, um, financial aid, there's just all these things that once you have a, that misdemeanor, you can't apply for. And um, now if you look at, you know, with the passing here in Colorado, we've got still people, I think Forbes just put an article, people are still getting arrested for this plant. Um, but this specific event is in Denver during National Expungement Week on Facebook, it's called the Denver Justice Event. A couple years ago, I used to, you know, I'm Filipino American, um, and I'd go to these cannabis events and I'd actually see that there wasn't a very diverse population. And um, so whenever I saw anyone Asian, I'd of course like run up and be very excited and want to introduce myself or anyone really. And, um, you know, Charlo Green came to Denver and she, put on a cannabis diversity event, I think maybe in 2015 or 16. And I used to joke, like, people have to come into Denver for us to talk about diversity. So this is something that definitely rings my heart, and I'm really excited about this, is that I do believe we need to talk about diversity, we need to talk about just social justice. Right now, even if you are a minority coming into Denver, trying to work in the industry, and you were looking for a mentor, um, I've had um, the woman that I've partnered up with this, Rose, um, Rosalie Flores, um, a colleague of mine, came to me and she, you know, moved here to Denver. She'd been here for three years, was looking for a mentor and, and couldn't get time with anyone. And that's something that's just, you know, when you're a minority, how do you get involved? Where do you go? I mean, it's, I mean, there's places that you can go, but like NCIA, I mean, to be a member of the National Industry Cannabis Association, you have to pay a thousand dollars. Not everyone has that, and so I'm hoping, you know, we can talk about diversity. We can offer this as a, like um, a first event, but you know, having some support for diverse groups coming into the industry, being a mentor. Um, that's something I'm very excited. And I'm really glad you <laughs> touched on that because there's no doubt the impression is and the reality is in Colorado and many other states, the cannabis sector is mostly predominantly white. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about diversifying it or ensuring that other players, people of color have access, what it comes down to is access to capital. Mm -hmm. And so there's some larger structural issues that, that need to be addressed. What do you think would be Damn, one yeah. or two remaining obstacles to ensuring that we achieve diversity in the cannabis sector? I think one, we need, we do need a group. Um, we do need um, a hub of place, you know, a resource center that, to talk about diversity and also to just, you know, go out and talk to their other communities and invite them in and figure out ways of how, you know, we can get other diverse members on board. I mean, I know in Colorado there's, there's just a handful and um, so I'm really excited about um, even just this year, we had our first um, opportunity summit and this was brought on by um, Kayvon. We worked with MCBA, Minorities Cannabis Business Association to put on the first ever opportunity summit. And it was there actually um, that we started talking about this. You know, you hear from other states of what they're doing to help minorities get funding, um, saving licenses for people that, you know, may not have the upfront capital to get a license, that there is some social justice. You do a lot of different things in cannabis. You're yeah. an advocate. You believe we should have diversity, and I also agree with that. So mm -hmm. tell me about some of the things that you've been able to do, whether traveling to other places mm -hmm. to attend events or um, other things that you maybe have planned in the future with some of the work that you're doing. Great, thank you. Um, so this year, right here behind me, there's a picture. Um, I was fortunate enough to attend um, Americans for Safe Access. They're the largest um, national trade association, 501c6, um, that lobbies 
for medical marijuana um, legislation, for patients, for access. Um, and they've been established since 2002. And so I've heard about them. And this was the first year that I said, you know, I really want to find out. And it, I was kind of, also I was wondering why doesn't Colorado have a chapter? I found up some background about that. Um, but, you know, um, I was very intrigued to go figure, you know, find out who ASA was. So I s applied for a scholarship to go to the Unity Conference. And actually, um, the theme was End Pain, Not Lives. And the theme for um, the Unity Conference was the opioid epidemic. And that's something that is very, I'm very passionate about. I'm, you know, in my mid 30s, and this is uh, accidental overdose is the number one killer of people in my age group under the, uh, under the age of 50. So I know very much peers of mine, brothers and sisters of my friends, um, some family, there's, addiction it sees no prejudice and um, we are losing people due to um, you know pharmaceuticals and addiction yeah, it's um, a massive problem it's a massive problem um, and it's actually killed more people than um, the Vietnam War um, and you know the statistics are just it's growing it's it's crazy and you might know that you know cannabis we've all heard this statistic um, a study done in JAMA that states that have a legalized cannabis program are seeing less opioid over um, deaths. There's some correlation to that. So of course, you know, seeing that this was a theme, being very intrigued and also feeling that we needed, we need a stronger medical community here in Denver, Colorado, that I was going to go and seek it out and see what I could learn. And so I did attend. It was, um, and I got to lobby on Capitol Hill with Americans for Safe Access. Oh, I got to great. meet actually Diana DeGette who's a District 1 um, House representative. You're in Colorado. In Colorado, yeah, in D.C. And I got to s speak with her one-on-one. -on -one. Um, ASA does really great. They provide a, a campaign briefing book. We were advocating for the CARES Act, um, which would allow research. And um, we got a minute with, you know, some time with uh, Diana to get. Yeah, I bet that's very inspiring. That was amazing. So when do you think we'll see the branch uh, start? Because you oh, said yeah. you might get one started. So we did start one in Colorado. We had a soft launch um, right now. We are in the talks of national, um, and it's called Safe Access Colorado, and it is the Colorado chapter of Americans for Safe Access. So um, we are just live as of this week. So more to come. I'm definitely going to post more information on my website. Um, which is influentialx.com. Great, man! But congratulations. Thank you. Again, another <laughs> undertaking, and you have this long list of um, of, um, uh, of successes and accomplishments. Oh. So we're running oh, out yeah, of time, yeah, but right. in the next few minutes, oh yeah, um, you also have this close relationship with hemp. You've done work oh, related yeah. to hemp. I know you have some past experience with the Industrial Hemp Research Foundation. Mm -hmm. So tell us about your interest in past work and maybe future work in the area of hemp. Oh yeah, so my past work was, yes, definitely at the uh, Industrial Hemp Research Foundation as the community engagement person. So I was in charge of community programs, fundraising ideas, and we had put on a fundraiser um, last June and we tied it to um, Dead & Company was in Boulder at Folsom Field. This, I mean, sells out every year. They bring thousands of people to Boulder. So what better way to kind of talk about cannabis in a different light to raise funding for research and to also give an update of what the IHRF was doing at the time. Um, a sleep study was underway and we were actually working with CU Boulder to get um, studies in, done in hemp. Um, so that was very exciting. And yes, I mean, just recently I was down at the Southern Hemp Expo, which is the first of taking NOCO Hemp Expo and bringing it down in South in the Bible Belt. And it was just amazing. Um, so before you go on, yeah, go ahead. let's make sure people know what those are. Because you, oh, yeah. you have the uh, Northern yeah. Colorado Hemp Expo yes. and then something in Kentucky. Yes. So just explain what those two things so are. So the NOCO Hemp Expo um, just had their sixth event, sixth year event consecutively. And they brought it down south called the Southern Hemp Expo. Sh she is the shorthand, which I love um, that, that it's called she. But so they pretty much brought programming. Um, they brought, you know, a bunch of companies together for education. They had even people from, you know, who started and paved the way back with, with Kentucky Hemp Farms. Um, so it was a great way, for, a great place for education. And for me, it was um, exciting because I really 
um, appreciated all the work that we do in Colorado. Sometimes I think we're in a bubble. So to go down in Nashville where they are just want all the information, they don't know sometimes the difference between hemp and marijuana, even that, or um, CBD and why it's a good food source. So it was great to kind of uh, give them education. Oh, that's great. <laughs> no, you're very fortunate to go to these different places. So um, another yeah. question for you. Um, how do you do it? So <laughs> you have all these different things going on. So what about, you know, how do you keep your sanity being so deeply entrenched in cannabis and hemp related activities? Um, you know, they say that it's really the passion that I have for this plant. And now that I've like um, branched off on my own, the independence of choosing where I actually want to line up my services, being able to vet properly vet who I can work with. That's something that everyone should do um, as a tip. And um, so how do I do it? I, you know, I, I'm a social person. I love it. So like going to events is just, it's great um, for me. And, you know, I keep my balance with um, some self care, you know, meditation, yoga, massages, you know, um, but for the most part, I'm, I'm living my passion. And so some of it is as much as I'm traveling and I'm busy with events and events can be so, <laughs> um, yes, uh, such a roller coaster. But at the end of the day, I'm, I'm living my passion. I'm working with people. I'm being influential of even just me being a good Samaritan and making, doing a Facebook live of supporting something that's worthy. And, you know, then it's, it's a win-win. It's a win for me. And that keeps me going. Melanie, very inspiring. Really appreciate you sharing um, all the work you're doing. Uh, maybe before we go, just uh, tell mm -hmm. people one more time how they can find you, the website, and if you're comfortable, the email address. Oh, sure. Yes. So um, you can find me, Melanie Rose Rogers. Uh, InfluentialX.com is the website. On Twitter, I'm Melanie Rose, um, spelled out. And on Facebook, it's InfluentialX. Um, and so that's how you can stay in touch with me. You can go to the website, sign up for the mailing list. So you, you get an invite to all the events. And yeah, I'm just really trying to, you know, raise the vibration and be an example of being a good influence in the community. Great, Melanie, thank you so much. Thank you. So we're gonna end it here. I'm Marty Otanias with Getting High in Anthropology. Thanks for tuning in and see you next time. AJ, that stuff makes you a stupid into cabeza. Jenny, my ex-wife, is amazing. She is from Bogota, Colombia. She sounds like my high school health teacher who talks about the evils of alcohol, sex, and cannabis. I am unable to understand why Colombians and others across the world demonize marijuana. The United States and its prohibitionist ideology fails to convince me and other citizens that cannabis ruins your brain. Since age 14, I have used and loved cannabis. It helped calm the chaos of alcoholism and drugs, which were just a normal part of my family life. Being a daily user did not prevent me from achieving a 3.8 grade point average and graduating high school at the top 14% of my class. Having zero money for college, I joined the Air Force. My job was to balance a 500,000 pound airplane mathematically with my brain while flying 24 hour days. Loadmasters are required to know every dimension, every crack of the Boeing C-17 inside and out. I completed scary and highly dangerous missions. During routine airdrop missions, I opened the door in flight with a parachute on to drop food, water, and supplies to soldiers in remote locations in Afghanistan. I flew National Science Foundation scientists of all different backgrounds to Antarctica, where I filmed penguins less than five feet away from me. The 10 years I was in the Air Force, I was of course cannabis free. On the day my military contract ended, I restarted cannabis consumption. It was one of the happiest days of my life. I married Jenny as I was transitioning to becoming a land surveyor. Jenny and I moved to North Dakota where I was surveying some intense landscapes in sub-zero temps. I, Jay, I don't understand how you can a smoke and a smoke and a smoke and still do your notes. She's referring to my survey notes that I create, depicting whatever data I gathered for the day. I don't know either. I guess all of the science that says cannabis degrades your cognitive function is a conspiracy across the world, haha. <laughs> I teased her. We relocated from North Dakota to Colorado to be closer to my son, for me to start college, and for low-cost medicinal cannabis. As an aviator, I was always nose deep inside of a map. This concept was only heightened as a surveyor, so it only made sense in my brain to study GIS, aka cartography. 
With many engineering ideas flowing through my brain, I chose to study computer automated drafting and design with hopes of making the visions come to life. One such vision was of a Japanese gazebo. For my final class project, I found an inspirational pagoda online and designed my own 2D version of it. Being 25% German, and as Frankfurt is my birthplace, I have a huge affinity for castles. This love was only compounded by the fact that I flew missions out of Germany for a decade. I was able to see too many castles to count. I've even walked around the famous Disneyland castle, or rather the new Schwanstein castle in Bavaria. This passion led me to obsess over how to design the best and smallest castle feasible, which also doubles as my future dream house when cannabis pays me big bucks one day. The castle I ended up creating helped pave my way to becoming a certified drafter designer. As a chemical engineer student, my brain is constantly filled with complex symbols, numbers, and equations. With free time, if not practicing the guitar or piano relentlessly, I'll be playing the app Chess with Friends throughout the day or hiking the creek vaping cannabis. Sadly, a large part of society would label me a stoner and think that stoners are flat out dumb or struggle with memory. Why can't the world see the good in cannabis or see beyond only medicinal purposes? I suppose it'll take me getting a PhD to help convince the people. Challenge accepted. High school seems like so long ago. I remember it as if it was yesterday. I tried hard alcohol a handful of times and remember drinking natural ice when my friends and I could convince someone to buy for us. Getting caught drinking by my parents was never as scary as the thought of being caught smoking weed. My sister was the straight A student. I believed that C's get degrees. May 2010, I graduated high school. You may know me as the person who never consumed weed. At the same time, I had an angel on my shoulder saying, good job, and a devil on the other side saying, try it, it won't kill you. Freshman year, I moved into the dorms, Chank and Saul, at Sacramento State. Can I complete college and stay cannabis free? The two girls next door to me became good friends. We went to house parties and ate at the dining hall hungover. Living in the city of trees, my friends and I saw weed everywhere. It was unavoidable that at some point I would experiment with cannabis. April 20th rolls around. What better day than the national holiday for stoners to try weed? In my dorm room, my friends and I stuffed towels at the bottom crack of the door and kept the dusty windows pried open. I gently held this foreign object and experienced a few unwanted coughs. I consumed cannabis and thought, how am I going to feel? When is it going to hit me? Smoking with Jessica and Gracie in our dorm rooms didn't happen every day, though when it did occur, we tried our best not to get caught. One night, we thought our luck ran out. It was Friday Eve freshman year in the dorm rooms. We were elevating ourselves, laughing our asses off. Knock, knock, knock comes from the door. We stop everything immediately. I panic and spray Febreze. Gracie opens the door and sees Stacy, the resident advisor, a.k.a. the wannabe dorm police. What are you doing? Stacy asks. In a shaky voice, Gracie responds, just hanging out. Stacy seems to believe us and she leaves. Trying hard not to laugh, Gracie shuts the door and turns to us with a look on her face. How the hell did Stacy believe we weren't smoking weed? Poor Stacy, so innocent and nice, always believing my friends and I were doing the right thing. It, it's now 2018. I live in Denver, Colorado. Cannabis consumption is something that works for me for medicinal purposes. A mix of THC and CBD eases my migraines and helps me focus when I do homework. While I have no need for hotboxing in the dorm room and misleading people like Stacy, I view legalization as a key element in my cannabis culture.